to hymn number 315. We'll sing through that two times, and then we'll turn over to hymn number 296. We'll sing through that two times as well. Number 315, his name is Ron. go to the Lord in prayer. I've already had one prayer request back there. We'll, uh, if you've got a prayer request you'd like to mention uh, this morning, let's do that right now. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Remember Brother Harold? All right.
think Virgil's got some tests coming up. DJ Hart. Tuesday. Okay. All right. The Davis family, keep them in our prayers. You got unspoken this morning, something on your heart? Boy, I do. Aren't you glad God already knows what it is? Whew. He's exalted. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, we do lift you up on high. We know you're already there, but you tell us that you, you, you want us to exalt you, to praise you, to worship you. You created us to praise you. There's so many ways of doing that. And here we are this morning, God, we're gathered together as a church family, loving on each other, spending time with each other. Lord, we're mindful of so many families this morning that's traveling for spending time with their family, remembering their loved ones that's passed on. Lord, I think that's wonderful, and I just pray that you'll be with them and give them safety. We have families traveling on vacation. Pray that you'll watch over them. The sick, the shut-in, Lord, the unspoken, every name that was listed here today. But Lord, as we begin, as we continue to prepare our hearts to worship you this morning, to see what your word has to say to us today. Father, I pray that we'll prepare our hearts and our ears to hear, and I pray you'll prepare your messenger. We love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our hymn of invitation. I mean, hymn of invitation. <laughs> our offering. <laughs> We're going to go scratch an invitation. <laughs>
tonight. We're going to be dismissing for Children's Church here in just a minute, but uh, we got one more song to sing. So, Isaac, well, I can't help it. Your son is the boss. And I know you can't stand that, but he's the boss. <laughs> Isaac, your mama ain't listening to you. I don't know. If y'all want to stand and sing number 289. All right, we'll sing one more song then. You got the FBI agent. <laughs> Miss Tisi's doing children's church, so she'll meet you back there at the door if you're going. It's the it's the very nice looking redhead walking back there, and so I can say that because it's my wife. <clears throat> well, look who done snuck in. All right, we got a crowd going. I think I'm going to go. <laughs> Would you take your Bibles this morning and turn to Philippians <clears throat> chapter 4? We're going to talk a little bit today about contentment. Are you content? I guess contentment, 
as a the definition of contentment can be both good and bad. Sometimes we get content when we ought not be content. We ought to drive harder and stay longer and all that good stuff. But the Bible does talk to us about being content. So we're going to look at that for a few minutes today. Paul, here in Philippians chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 11 through 13. Paul says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to uh, uh, to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me may God add his blessing to the reading of his word let's look at this for a few minutes today Paul had learned a very very important secret God taught Paul this secret and I'm glad today that Paul didn't wrap it up in a pretty gift and sell it for 1995. Nor did he go on a world tour and, uh, you know, sell his secret. He was obedient to the Lord. And Paul told the church in Philippi about this. And in the process, he's telling us about it. And every Christian since then. So let's dive in and find this secret that Paul has about contentment. Number one, Paul knew the secret of an appeal or making an appeal. That word appeal, it, it's, it means a serious or urgent request. I mean, you're getting ready to ask somebody something and this is something you need. It's urgent. It's serious. And that, that's how that word appeal is uh, defined. We may think of it used in the court, making an appeal. So it's very similar. But when we get the idea of that Paul knew how to go to God and make this appeal unto him. There's a couple things I want to mention here. How did Paul know that? How did Paul know uh, know that secret how did he learn that because God taught him and we look in here and Paul's prayer life had to be connected to God so I want to spend a few minutes on that because I believe it's important so Paul knew the secret of an appeal and so he knew that his conversation with God had to be constant in other words constant conversation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 17 says what? Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. It's constant conversation. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? What does it mean to pray without ceasing? I, I mean I was born at night but not last night. It's continuous prayer. It's constant being connected it's always talking to God about everything and everybody. It's always. That's Paul's secret. He knew that he, in, in order to do the things that he had to do, he had to be in constant conversation with his father. So do we. Have you ever noticed that when you got unconnected or when you stopped your conversation with God, that those are the times that you fell or you fell behind or you fell back or whatever the case might be. Every time in my life I can look back and when I failed, it's because I stepped away, not because God did. We must be listening all the time. Suppose I go to the doctor. And, and I go to the doctor and I said, Doctor, I've, I've got a lot of problems here. I've twisted my knee, my eyes itch, my finger here is swollen, I've got a backache, I've got all these things wrong with me. And then after going through that entire list of telling the doctor, What's wrong with me? I look at my watch and I'm like, oh, Lord, time has, time's flying. I got to go. And, and, and out the door I go. And the doctor's saying, well, you're not going to listen to what i got to say. I mean, so what, what's the point of going to the doctor if you're not going to listen to what he says? I, I know we've got, we've got a lot of doctors. Uh, we've got a lot of people that go to the doctors that don't do what the doctors say. Am I, am I right or wrong? 
I'll do what the doctor tells me to do if I like what the doctor told me to do. <laughs> and, and, and if I don't, you know, when he says eat less, I'm like, he don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> we have to listen. Listen. If we only speak to God and never take time to listen to God, we make the same mistake. We, we, we hop down on our knees and say, God, I need this, 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 this. Pray for that person, that person, and, uh, and, and got to go. And, and God's like, you're not going to listen to what I got to say? And many times we don't, do we? We do all the talking, but we don't actually listen to Him. But our relationship with God is meant to be a two-way street. God wants us to talk to Him because God wants us to, to share with Him what's on our heart. God wants us to, to share our burdens with Him. He says, bring me your burdens. But God also wants us to listen, to listen. We just sang that song uh, about Elijah. I, I, I went back and was studying a little bit in Elijah uh, on Elijah this week. Uh, Elijah made a famous fire in first, first Kings chapter 18 where God showed up and showed out for, to the prophets of Baal and put them in their place. But it was over in chapter 19. So if you read First Kings chapter 18, great story. I've heard so many sermons on it, and it's such a great story, powerful story. But over in chapter 19, after Elijah does this incredible thing, and God begins to show this incredible power. And if you hadn't read the story, you just go read it later. But God showed up and showed off and showed out and showed how much power he has. And over in chapter 19, Elijah wants to die. Blows my mind. Elijah is way too much like me. Are you like Elijah sometimes? God shows up and he does this incredible thing in your life. And, and, and God shows his power and you've got this great testimony. And next Sunday you just lay out of church and say, I just want to die. I'm just going to sleep in. It's what Elijah did. After the power of God was shown, the Bible says in chapter 19 of 1 Kings that he hid himself. And in fact, chapter 19, verse 4, uh, in a translated uh, Bible, it says, Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. He said, Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. What? Wait a minute. Look what God just did. But God says in verse 10 in chapter 19, God says to Elijah, what are you doing? I don't know about y'all, but I'm confident that God has said to me, what are you doing? He says there in verse 10, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served you, Lord, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've, they've torn down your altars. They've killed every one of your prophets. And I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. But God says in verse 11, Go out and stand before me. First Kings 19. Go out and stand before me on the mountain. The Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, now, now listen to me, so don't lose me where I'm at, because I'm talking about listening to God. Listening to God. But let me read this. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord, listen, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. You and I have to intently, intentionally, we have to stop and listen to God. 
Because we live in a world of earthquakes and fire and wind. And there's so much noise. And you and I need to stop. Cut it off. Turn it off. And stop and listen to God. Amen? I, I do. I, I'm preaching to myself. If nobody else needed that, I needed that. So the question is, are we listening for God in that still small voice? We may be waiting for God to boom. I like when He God booms. That way I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. There's a lot of things that's happened in my life where I've, I've like, God, you could, you could. You could literally write it in the clouds. Yeah, I, you could do it in English. <laughs> do it in some other language. I'll take a picture and get a translator. But if you could just do it so I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And God says, uh... Have you kind of forgot about this little faith thing that I've been talking to you about? So we may be waiting for God to blast His voice, that fiery voice, the strong voice. But God could be speaking to us in a, just that gentle whisper. Our conversation with God needs to be constant. It needs to be consistent. We need to be connected. You know what John 15, 5 says? He, he said, I'm the van, vine. I'm the van. I'm the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. So the connection has to be made. We have to be connected all the time because we've got to be conversating all the time. All the time. It's how Paul received his instruction. What does it mean to be all in? What does it mean to you when somebody says, I need you to be all in. I need you to be 100% committed. I love when the coach says, I need you to commit 110%. You can't commit 110%. All you can do, 100% is the max. You can't go above that, right? 110, more than. Okay, anyway. I've had some life lessons, haven't you? Some were learned the hard way. I'm glad all of them wouldn't learn the, long, the hard way. But Paul learned that his appeal must be made when he's connected with God. Here's the thing. We ask God for things and we don't even know what we're asking God for because we haven't stopped and listened to God. So that's number one, that, that appeal. Paul also knew the secret of assurance. Paul knew that he had to have faith and, and believe in God. It's like I was talking a while ago. I wish so bad that when it comes a time in our life that we've got to make this major career change. Or maybe we move. Or we sell our house. Or we do something big and change jobs. We've got this important decision to make. We want God to make it so clear. Because at the end of the day, do you want to do what God wants you to do? I do. I, I can say that with all honesty in my heart. My actions may not always prove it. But in my heart, I know I can say, God, God, I want to do what you want me to do. I want to go where you want me to go. Whatever it is, God, you tell me and I do it. And if you could send in an email, that would be great. But God... See, Paul knew the secret of assurance. I bet you Paul, I mean, if I got roughed up and beat up and, and, and shipwrecked and everything that Paul went through, I would really want to know that my next move was ordered by God and not just something I come up with. You know, because I'm, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't come up with keep going. <laughs> I'd be like, well, time to retire. Leave our head to the coast. Paul knew that he had to have faith and believe in God. And he needed that at all times. And you know what? You and I cannot have it unless we're connected with God. How many knows that this morning? We, we, we got to do it. And, and, and isn't it true that when we get unconnected, while we're flopping like a fish out of water, 
Because we don't know what to do. We're not connected to the vine. He said, I'm the vine. You're the branches. We've got to be connected to him. Paul knew that he could have this assurance in the storms of life. We all have storms, right? Anybody here never had a storm in your life? Turmoil, I mean, you've never had anything wrong? Of course there's not. Everybody, every single one of us here has faced a storm in their life. Well, guess what storms do sometimes? Sometimes storms turn things over. One of the things, I, I, our, our house over at Spruce Pine, uh, the creek back there, we've been amazed that since we've had that house, I think about eight or eight or nine years now, we've had that house, and it's amazing how the creek keeps changing. I mean, I got pictures of it when we first bought it, and it had an island. You know, it was a big, wide spot, and it had a little island. I thought, I own an island. <laughs> do, do you own an island? I own the island. <laughs> I don't own no island no more. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's over the years it's just washed away and the and the banks give way a little bit and then the banks grow back a little bit. I don't know how that grows back, but but these these big old rocks, look, there's no way that rock can be moved. And then when it's covered in water, the water goes down and that big old rock's gone. How in the world did that happen? It just keeps changing. Storm sometimes uh turns things over. And it might be in your life you need something turned over. God needs you to see what's on the other side, and the only way that's going to get turned over is a storm come up in your life. We don't like it, but sometimes we need it. We do tend to see things that we want to see, don't we? I do. No one is exempt from these storms in our life, but just as the disciples, I begin to think about, you remember when Jesus walked out to the disciples, this big storm, they're in the boat, and, and they were afraid. I would be too. But they're out there in the middle. And what do they say to Jesus when they see Jesus come in and, and, and Jesus says, peace be still, and everything settles down? Who is this man? Elijah. Great, awesome time in the Lord, and God showed up and showed off. A chapter later, he just wants to die. The disciples see Jesus feeding the multitude. See all these miracles. See the power that he has. And now they're scared to death. And they ask, who is this guy that even the wind obeys him? Well, who do you think he is? But we are guilty of the same thing. Sometimes we may ask, who, who is this Jesus that thinks he can take care of this problem? i got to take care of it myself. Who is this the disciple pondered? Even the wind and the waves obey him. See, it's through our trials that we, you and I can learn that no storm is too big for God. No storm is too big. Paul also learned this assurance in his struggles. You say, what's the struggle? See, Paul put his trust in God no matter what came his way. And obviously, that's our goal. Amen? That's our goal. Have you ever heard someone suggest that if you're just receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then everything else is going to be hunky-dory for the rest of your life? I've heard, I, I have heard people say that. Now, we know it's not true. But I have heard people say that. Boy, I tell you what, you get on the winning side. You get on the Jesus side. Boy, you're just going to fly through life. No, you're not. That's when the troubles really start. Because that's when the devil says, Oh, I about lost him. I better get after him. Why the struggle? Somehow... In God's way of making things work out, our troubles advances the kingdom. Why? How? I don't, I don't know. But I know for a fact that God has taken a storm and a struggle in my life, and I'm thinking, why did I have to go through that? And I have seen God take it, and He has helped somebody else. 
He has taken what I've gone through and blessed someone else. And someone else just says, boy, if he can do it, I know I can do it. So God will use the struggle. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 1, in the last days, perilous times will come. And we're going to continue to face those perilous times. Paul did know the secret of assurance. He learned to trust God in the storms and the struggles of life. The third thing, last thing. Paul knew the secret of assignment. Stay with me. Paul could say, I know whom I believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You see, Paul had failures in his life. And you know what? He took those failures in his life, he gathered them up, and he said, God, here they are. He's just going to sign that file put that on file 13 and give it to God. Forget your failures. Too many failures is holding people back. Just because you failed today and tomorrow doesn't mean that you'll fail the next day. Too many people have failed and because they failed, they don't want to move forward. You know what we've got to do? We've got to forge forward. Too many marriages have failed. There's been too many failures in, in, in moral character. But guess what? We can recover. Why? Because God loves us and God forgives. Amen? How many knows that this morning? God loves us and God forgives us. So we've got to keep going forward. We've got to keep doing. We've got to keep on keeping on, as the preacher says. We've got to forge into the future with faith. To move ahead slowly. Uh, this word forge means to progress steadily. Now, now understand, I'm not saying forward the river. Uh, and and y'all educated people, you say, I believe the correct term there would be to forward the river. No, we're not talking about fording the river. We're talking about forging the river because, I mean, tell you, oh, we sang that song a while ago, didn't we? About the rivers in life and God will give us what we need to, to get on across the river. But it means to move ahead slowly, progress steadily, to forge through dense underbrush. Somebody here knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> to move ahead with, with, with uh, an increased speed and effectiveness. To forge ahead and to finish the work in a burst of energy. This is exactly what you and I need to do. There's failures in our life, but we need to forge into the future with faith. Paul did assign his failures to God. He gave them to God. And he was able to put his faithfulness to God. Contentment is self-sufficiency. In other words, it is making up your mind and getting it right in your heart that you're not going to depend on circumstances to satisfy you but you're going to depend on Jesus. And the reason why is because if you depend on circumstances, when things are good, you're satisfied, and when things are bad, you're dissatisfied. Not things. Paul knew that he had to be connected, and he had to be in constant conversation with God to do the things he did. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Let me say this, Paul was confident and his assurance was in Christ. There's much more than time will allow, but consider all that Paul achieved, all he did. He did it being connected to Christ and being in constant conversation with God. That's the way you do it. Friend, this morning, God has a task for you, a decision that you need to make. How are you going to do it? connect with God and stay in constant conversation with God today. You may leave here today. It's a decision that you need to make this week. What do you need to do? Be connected to God and stay in constant conversation with Him. Father, we pray during this time, Lord, that decisions will be made to please You, to glorify You. God, may we have a spirit here today of not only reverence, but a spirit 
of unity, God, that we might have a spirit of openness, Lord. Let's pray for one another during this time. God, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand now and sing our hymn of invitation, you respond as the Lord tells you during